Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode number 19, titled, The Danger of Just Meditate. There's a great thing going around in America now, a big thing, a big panacea thing, like, just meditate. You just meditate, you can be like, you know, working for Grumman, making, like, attack helicopters. And, but you meditate, you'll be cool. And it's really not the case. It's not, at least it's not Buddhism. You can palliate some of your anxiety by just meditating with an with a empty mind, with not think, trying not to think, or with an with a ordinary misunderstanding of reality that we ordinarily grow up with and are educated in. But if you just meditate that way, you only palliate your anxiety. You will never overcome it. You will not come to enlightenment, which means an understanding of the nature of reality. You will just temporarily dampen down your worries. And because we worry so much, we think by when they dampen down for a little while, we think that we're enlightened. The danger is we will think they're enlightened, because we know we can retreat back into that dampened down state. And then, we, then, then that removes from us the motive to make the non-dampened down state a little less worrisome, a little more jolly, a little more cheerful and happy. And if you just imagine a little bit disappearing into a vast space, you can imagine that some of you may have genuinely had that experience, and therefore may somehow secretly, not really telling your spouse, because she probably wouldn't serve you dinner or he wouldn't uh, give you car fare or whatever, but thinking secretly, maybe I a little bit got enlightened because I disappeared. That must have been enlightened. <laughs> secretly thinking. And then we, can, we can point to some examples in history of yogis and people and teachers who claim enlightenment because they experience disappearance. And then they go around saying, I experienced emptiness, so I'm enlightened. But that's very, very mistaken. They did not experience emptiness. What is the famous Pragnaparamita thing which you all know? Although I consider it a, a bad style and also mistranslated. You know, emptiness is form and form is emptiness. Emptiness is not other than form, and form is not other than emptiness. But that's a mistranslation. I translate it. Voidness is matter, and matter is voidness. Form means matter, not form. It's a mistranslation from ancient time in Buddhist circles. From Plato, maybe, the forms, you know. And, and also the word rupa in Sanskrit, which is what it translated, can mean a visual object for which they pick form and it's defined in, in Indian Buddhist thought or science as form and color, shape and color. But they just take form in general. So there it's directly translated as form. But as an aggregate, you know, which is one of the five aggregates that is meant here in Prajnaparamita, it's matter. And that's what's shocking about it. If you see vaguely form, oh yeah, voidness is form, form is oh, you sure that, yeah, that's cool, I'm cool with that. No, voidness is matter. That means that this solid supposed thing, hand and, chair, and armchair, chair arm, that is voidness. Not some space inside it, or not when it blows up or disappears. It itself, as matter, is voidness. You follow? That's where the shock is, really. Or that is emptiness. So there, this is all emptiness. So we're in emptiness. And we can't really realize emptiness in that kind of grasping way because the realizer is just as empty. Well, emptiness is realizing emptiness? Big deal, thanks, emptiness. Good for you. I didn't do it. You don't realize emptiness. You melt into emptiness, actually. But the shock of that is you melt into emptiness and you don't disappear. You're sitting around with a bunch of unmelted entities who are like looking at you like, what are we going to do now? <laughs> Okay? So, now the way of that, that, however, that illusion like aftermath samadhi is a really important thing. 
And I mean, the, and the space like Ekoport Samadhi is a really important thing. And it's very, very valuable. And I want to read a little passage, one of my favorite passages from, from the uh, Lekshin Nimbo, where Tsongkhapa totally blew my mind many years ago. Still blowing it every time I read it. <clears throat> it's one little, little paragraph. Uh, ニューゴタワラランキングオーヤウズンバタ。テメブズンバタ。デニキテニガンギチャンテムドマテウズンバスムヨラ。タワチェウジュラスンダユチャン。タワマネウジュラ。タンポタンタマニレメベチェプナム
that first step of the experience of selflessness, where everything seems to disappear, including the self, then I have at least some seed of that perception of it as extrinsically non-existent, if you follow me, everything that I see. So I see it as illusory. So I'm balancing my investing it with a tremendous solidity, with, with uh, I'm balancing that with an investment that it will disappear under analysis, with the seemingly, as if I had an intrinsically real experience of emptiness or voidness, <coughs> which when I experience it seems intrinsically real. That seems like that's the deeper reality. That's where I land. But although you never know that you've landed there, because when you disappear, it's like that disappointing thing that happens in the dentist chair. You get that sodium pentothal in case you've had a tooth pulled and that dentist used that. And you're, you know, you've been worrying all day and all week and all month and all year and tax time came and went and all this stuff. Paid all those tickets. You know, whatever you did. And you're about to like be really obliterated for a short time. And, and then, then they say, get up and get out of here and stop bleeding in the chair. <laughs> and it's an hour and a half later and there's no sense of time in the obliterated state. There's just a threshold buzz, and then they throw you out. Because obviously when you're completely unconscious, there's no sense of time. Similarly, it's sleep, even sleep. You know, if you were enlightened by disappearing, everybody's enlightened because everybody disappears every night. They have some time of deep, dreamless sleep, which there's no sense of time in, because there's no subject-object registry. So we'd all be like, we could all run out and say, I experienced emptiness, so I know you pay my parking ticket. <laughs> okay? So, so that's, so the point then is that the state of disappearance is not it. Now, in another plane, the dualistic Buddhists, Theravada, Mahasangika, and the Tibetan Buddhists are Theravada Buddhists, or monks, and even lay people. The monk's vow of the Buddhists, you know, we go on about Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism, that is really a little bit wrong because all the monks have Theravada Buddhist vows. There are no Mahayana Buddhist monk vows. Monks and nuns are Theravadans. <laughs> they are. It's because the monk and the, the, the lay person thing, the mendicant and the lay person thing, is a dualism. Right? And samsara and nirvana is a dualism. And by becoming a mendicant, they're heading for nirvana to get out of samsara. So they even have a theory that the disappearing is nirvana. And of course, they get like Shariputra and the Lotus Sutra, that they get a big fat disappointment when they think they're going to disappear. But then they're standing around, and Shakyamuni says, like, Bring me, go get me a cup of coffee. And uh, Ananda, you know, they, they say that. They had a disappearance. And then they appear, and then they have a theory that, well, that disappearance was nirvana, but uh, there's a momentum, I have a, a, a samsaric momentum of my body and my conventional mind, and therefore I'm going to hang out like an arhat for some while to hang, because it's so much fun hanging out with Shakyamuni because he's so confused. This, and... And I'm going to do that, and then, but luckily, then when I die, I'll revert, since I'm not afraid of that dissolution state, I'll revert to that dissolution state, and I won't be reborn, and I won't have to hang out anywhere else anymore. And, you know, you can read it in all those sutras, this is my last birth, and no more to be done, and blah, 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 you know, and goodbye. And then when Shakyamuni dies, they say he's done pari nirvana, which means he's also died and gone. And the, in the ancient arguments, which were not as numerous as you think in ancient India, because most of the Mahayana people were Theravada monks, like in Tibet. And mostly the glory and magnificence of the Mahayana worldview, they loved it and they embraced it. But there were some holdouts, which then were called Hinayana, which was, was not all Theravada monks, it was only those who hina themselves. Hina means deprived. It doesn't mean smaller, it means deprived. And they deprived themselves of that magnificent view of the Buddhaverse, you know, the Buddha land, the Mahayana. The land filled with jewels, you know, like incredible, marvelous vision of the Mahayana. Filled with Buddhas, like Buddhas in every atom, you know. Incredible vision. And they deprived themselves. That's why they were called Hinayana. 
only those who refused that. But those who did, did so on the basis that Buddha doesn't have a body. Attaining Buddhahood means you realize you don't need a body. You just dissolve into this vast infinity. Now, Buddha himself, in the Theravada scriptures, which were oral for many centuries, he told them. For example, there are four formless states, or four immaterial states, as it should properly be translated. These are states beyond the speed of light. Einstein thought everything was ended at speed of light because he thought everything was only material. But beyond speed of light, it's the super subtle energies are there. And there are these four states. And the first of them is called infinite space. The second one is called infinite consciousness. It sort of fills the space, but there's no sense of duality of the person who reaches those four states in the sense that their consciousness is just everything. But somehow, without thinking consciousness, because they're not doing any verbalization, they don't have bodies, ordinary bodies, they're in a vast consciousness then being in a vast consciousness seems a little bit disturbing to them or it's too busy to be a consciousness with no object just like a spreading, con an infinite consciousness. So then they go into a state known as the state of absolute nothingness. But it's a state, it's not absolute, now there is no such thing as absolute nothingness, but there's a state that seems like absolute nothingness. That's the third one. And that seems peaceful to them. You know, it's, it's more peaceful than being in infinite consciousness, too tiresome. I mean, from consciousness is really boring because there's nothing to be conscious of. Because all there is is my consciousness. Much better to conk out. And then the fourth one is most subtle, the state beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. Now that, those four states, the, when the Buddha went, left the palace, remember, in his life, in all versions, his first guru, in the first ashram, his first Hindu or Vedic, there was no Hindus at that time, there were Vedists, his first Vedist guru had a yogis who reached the state of absolute nothingness, and they thought that was the ultimate, and that was, that was ultimate reality. And they say that Buddha reached that state himself in one day, because he was like a quick study. And then he said, that's not the absolute. That's just a state of oblivion, not the absolute. So he said, thanks a lot, I don't want to inherit, because the guy, the, the teacher said, you can now lead the group, you know, could be my successor. He said, I don't want to do that. That's not the ultimate, goodbye. He went to the next guy, who then reached beyond that to the state beyond consciousness and unconsciousness, which the Hindus call Turiya, even still today, and they think that's nirvana. And Buddha said, no, those formless realms are not nirvana. They are states you can attain, and actually they're rather dangerous states, because when you reach them, if you have not learned ahead of time, the royal reason of relativity, the teaching of selflessness, you will reify your condition in those states as the, as the absolute. And then you will not bother with your human body any longer. If you came from there from being a human yogi, it will seem much too boring for you with all the real problems, all the medical issues. And you will become a deity of the formless realm. And you will stay in there for many aeons. And then you'll suddenly have a big shock and you'll land back on West Broadway, if you're lucky. <laughs> And you wonder, where am I? What am I doing? And you wasted all that time. And you didn't achieve enlightenment. And you didn't become a bodhisattva. And you didn't help anybody. And you just got stuck in this reified absolute state. That's why Buddha was careful to tell. There are those four states. And actually, it's good yoga to develop the stability of concentration to be able to go into them if you know that any state that has a barrier between it and an ordinary state is a kind of extraordinary state, but it's still a relative state. Because an absolute, there's no such thing as an absolute state uh, that a relative being can enter. If it has an entry point, it's relative. It's just logical. So since it's, an, since it's a relative state, a seeming absolute relative state, the, you enter it by a causal process, namely of meditative expertise and stability, and extreme stability of mind, and then that cause will exhaust its force and you will leave it later. Mm -hmm. if you follow. Whereas nirvana is defined as the uncreated, having existed primordially from the beginning, and therefore the undestroyed. So actually it's always been here, or it's worthless. And, and in a way it's not here, because here is a relational word. So then, it becomes, then they say, they, we can't talk, you know, like they go, oh, I don't know, that kind of thing. But then they talk forever. <laughs>
but that, but that, but nirvana in all terms, like avoidness, nirvana, selflessness, they're all negational terms. That's the key point. And the negation is not a positive thing. The non-elephant in this room is simply the failure to find the elephant. It is not a thing in this room. If you follow. And similarly, in the Parinibbana Sutta in Pali, when the Buddha attains Parinibbana, he gives them a big fat hint, which the dualist people don't get. Where if you go read that sutta, you will see his mind goes up out of the desire realm, which is the human plane, into the realm of pure matter, and up to the, the nine planes of pure matter, no, 16 planes of pure matter, you know, three, 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 and seven, the four measurables, right? Love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And then goes up through the four formless states, just to sort of hone the one-pointedness. Then does not go to par nirvana out of the topmost formless state of beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. Comes all the way back down to the base of the realm of pure matter, between the material realm and the pure material realm and the desire material realm. And then goes back up again to the boundary between the highest part of the realm of pure matter, which is called Akanishta, or Brahmas, which is where the highest Brahma dwells. Although there's two branches of Akanishta, there's where the higher Brahma dwells, the world god, and then there's the plane on the event horizon of infinite space, where all the Buddha lands exist, actually, in Mahayana. It's that plane where Amitabha's pure land is and where all the sort of celestial Buddha verses are. And, and then disappears into Parinibbana from there. So very cleverly, given the hint is that the, disappear, the, the disappearance from his physical ordinary body, human body, or not, it's not very unordinary, the Shakyamuni's body, but still it's close to an ordinary body. But he disappears from that in a plane between the material and the immaterial to indicate that it's something other than just the ab abolition of materiality. It's not, in other words, an obliteration. And I have a new meaning for the word pari nirvana, actually, myself, which is that recently came to me, which I enjoy, sort of non-dual definition of pari nirvana, because pari means thorough or total. So pari nirvana, total nirvana means totalizing nirvana by leaving the appearance of a separate body that beings sort of relate to is like Buddha's over there. The Buddha joins with nirvana, which is all beings and everything everywhere, the Dharma time. So he totalizes nirvana. But when he leaves this one, he's like nirvana in all of us. That's fine. 